Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jerry's here too. And this is Stuff You Should Know, part of our ongoing Amazing Animals edition. Maybe the most robust rhinoceros like suite of all of our suites. Probably. That or crime and punishment. Sure. Sure. But I think everybody can get behind, you yeah. know, sloths and elephants, and not everybody's like, sure, prison. Right. Or crime scene cleanup. Sure. Well, that was a tough one. <laughs> but today we're adding to the animal one, and we're adding a good one, Chuck. This is a great pick. Cause Thank you. We're talking about naked mole rats. And they're one of those things like um, narwhals, where you're like, I've heard of it. I know everybody's into them and everything. But unlike narwhals, when you do a little investigating into them, naked mole rats are ridiculously interesting. They are. Uh, and I think I mentioned this on an episode, but where I got this idea, uh, it was long simmering because uh, the great Errol Morris documentary, Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, mm -hmm. which, have you seen it? No. Uh, it's a great documentary. It's It's been around for a long time. And in that documentary, he takes, uh, I think, three uh, disparate professions, gentlemen who perform these professions, and also uh, ties it into an old uh, lion tamer guy from a circus with, like, footage and telling his story. Uh, there's, like, a, a robot scientist, a topiary gardener, the aforementioned lion tamer from footage, and then this guy who is a naked mole rat scientist. Oh, yeah. What's his name? I don't remember his name. I can picture his face. Uh, and looking at, you know, um, when that documentary was, it was pretty early on and kind of what we knew about naked mole rats. So he mm -hmm. was probably on the on the leading edge. But On the uh, that's bleeding I, edge? No, not the bleeding edge. Uh, that's when I first sort of discovered the naked mole rat and fell in love with what might be the ugliest animal on earth. <laughs> <laughs> for real, for real. Yeah, I saw somewhere that um, National Geographic described them as bratwurst with teeth. <laughs> oh, man. And apparently the guy who first described them, Edouard Ruppel, back in 1842, when he described them, other biologists were like, well, clearly, Ruppel, you're dumb because this has got to be a baby of some sort, of right. some other species, or these things are diseased. They're right, not their own mistake. thing. <laughs> yeah. And he said, no, really, I think they're their own thing. And he turned out to be right. But that just goes to show just how weird looking they are that even biologists were like, what is this thing? Yeah, like any naked animal, uh, and there are a handful, is strange looking to people that are accustomed to mammals with fur. Yeah. Uh, I should say mammals. Um, but the naked mole rat is, I mean, boy, this thing is like a, a – a, only a mother could love is the saying, I think. A face and body. For sure. And they all have the same mother, pretty much. Oh, wow. Look at you. Yeah, we'll get into that later. But Dro Dropping a hint. Let's talk a little bit about the taxonomic classification of naked mole rats, shall we? Yeah. Uh, take it away. Because they used to be classified differently, but it's they finally settled on giving them their own little space now, right? I don't know that they settled on it. I think it's proposed and not everybody in the naked mole rat research community agrees on it. But but oh, okay. they are rodents. They're in the order Rodentia. They're in the family Bathyergidae. I even practiced that. That's I know, so frustrating to have practiced it's, it. <laughs> it's a tough word. Out loud and still miffed it. No, I think you got it. Bathier, Bathyergidae. Yeah, I got it the second time, but it should have rolled off my tongue for as much as I practiced it. That never does. So um, all of the family Bathyergidae are are located in sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. And uh, there's a bunch of different kinds of mole rats. It's just the naked mole rat is its own thing. And it's mm -hmm. so distinct in so many different ways that, like you were saying, some naked mole rat scientists are like, They're, th we just need to make their own family. Because right now they're a separate genus. They're their own genus, heterocephalidae. Practice that one too. <laughs> but they're so different from the other uh, members of the family that they're like, we should not just classify them as their own genus and species. We should classify them as their own family, this one 
type of animal should be its own family. Not everybody's on board. Yeah, but I think everyone listening has a family member that, <laughs> you know, they think maybe should be classified as, as their own family. Always naked, buck teeth. <laughs> sure. Exactly. That family member. Rusty. Yeah, Uncle, Uncle Rusty. Uh, like you mentioned, they the naked mole rats live throughout the Horn of Africa, mm -hmm. uh, generally in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia. And they are doing great. There are a lot of them. This isn't one of those. I feel like most of the animals we cover have some sort of threatened uh, designation. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're killing it, and they're doing awesome. There's lots of them. One reason why is because the land that they live under— is so arid that um, it's not usually disturbed for cropland. So they, they don't get into fights with farmers typically, which would be a big problem for them because they would eat all the farmers' crops and the farmers would kill yeah. them all. Um, so because they don't really dwell where humans tend to dwell, that's a big mark in their favor from what I saw. Totally. Uh, they, I mean, hopefully you've looked up a picture, like pulled off to the side of the road or something if you're driving to see mm -hmm. a picture of these things. So you have an idea of what we're talking about. Uh, if not, do so, uh, because you might think they look like maybe a newborn guinea pig or something. Maybe. I mean, that's being kind, I guess. And that's uh, the adults. Or, yeah, exactly. Uh, but they did diverge from uh, guinea pigs, they believe, about 50 million years ago. So they're, they're related in a way, but they, like you said, they really are their own thing. Yeah, and they're pretty much not related to moles or rats. It's their closest r relative is guinea pigs, like you said. And one of the things that really makes naked mole rats um, special is that they are fossorial, which is a type of animal that lives underground pretty much all the time. They yeah. don't live underground when it's hot out and then come out at night to feed or hunt. They live underground. I'm sure plenty of them spend their entire lives underground, and their lives are significant in, in length, as we'll see. But that's a, that's a big distinction because there's a lot of animals that live underground but spend time above ground too, not naked mole rats. No, they love it down there. Uh, and as we've covered in the, what was the biospeleology episode, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Oh, and we also, didn't we also do one on other cave-dwelling animals? Or was that that one? I think it was that one. All right. Either one or two of those. But we, you know, they have some features that other animals who live generally deep underground uh, for a lot of their lives have, mm -hmm. which is not really useless eyes. I mean, they have, technically they have eyes. Uh, they can sense bright and dark, but they're basically blind uh, and they don't have ears really either. They have, you know, little tiny ear flaps if they have anything at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're about three to four inches long, except for the queen, who can be a bit bigger. We'll yeah. Talk about the queen because it's very, very interesting. Uh, and then they have a little short tail, uh, sort of a tapered tail, and then a little piggy snout. But what's really, like when you look at a naked mole rat, the first thing you're going to notice is they're naked and really wrinkly and funny looking. Mm -hmm. And then those chompers up front. Yeah, because their teeth, if you look closely— they come out of their face, not yeah. their mouth. Yeah, they can close their mouth which and is, still have their teeth out. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's an adaptation that they came up with um, where they can use their teeth to dig while their mouth is closed so they keep dirt from getting in their mouths. Yeah, it's amazing. And uh, you dug up some extra stuff, which is pretty remarkable, about those teeth. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a little bit about the teeth, probably a lot about the teeth. Sure. But they're, they basically function as a sense organ. Scientists have found that the somo, oh man, I practiced that one too, somatosensory <laughs> cortex, that's not even a hard one, right. uh, which is involved in the sense of touch is very, very large. And about a third of it is dedicated to those incisors. So they actually feel through those teeth. Yeah. they Yeah. Like you said, it's a sense organ. That's really cool. They also use them not only to sense the world, but also to like carry stuff around. They can use them like needle nose pliers. They can move them independently in all sorts of different weird directions. They are, I don't know of any other animal that has teeth as a sense organ. It's pretty cool. No. How about those jaws, too? So because their teeth are so important to them, not just for eating, but for digging and creating their habitats and for defense, too, um, their jaws, uh, I think 25% of their entire muscle mass of their body is in their jaws, specifically 
in the jaw muscle, the deep masseter muscle. Mm-hmm. If you make, if you put three fingers upward on your cheek, so that um, you're kind of making that scout's honor thing. Sure. And the the <laughs> finger closest to you is uh, just touching your ear, the, the outside of your ear, or where uh-huh. your ear touches your face. Man, I'm doing it. And then you start making a chewing sound or chewing um, motion. Do you feel uh-huh. how it's like your cheek is pushing out against your fingers beneath? I do. That's your masseter. And then do yeah. one other thing. Leave your fingers there. Don't move. Oh, all right. All right. But slide them up a little further to your temple and then mm-hmm. do the same thing. Yeah. You feel that muscle moving? Yeah, that's the, the headache uh, button. Exactly. That's your masseter muscle as well. So we have them too, but only about 1% of our muscle mass is invested in our jaws. A quarter of their yeah. muscle mass is invested in their jaw and specifically in the masseter complex. Yeah, it's amazing. And that makes those teeth basically like, it's sort of like a shovel chisel uh, combination. It's they a can, shovel. They, it is a shovel. They have tremendous power. Or a shizzle. To, to, <laughs> uh, Snoop Dogg has that uh, trademark, <laughs> so I think we get sued for that. Uh, and we'll be like, hey, go after the naked mole rat, Snoop. <laughs> I saved those sideburns years ago. <laughs> uh, so they use them, you know, they're they're scraping. They're always digging. They're always carrying dirt. Uh, like you mentioned, they can close their little lips because they don't want to get dirt in their mouths. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're always just sort of at work uh, digging tunnels. They're like Charles Bronson in The Great Escape. <laughs> right. Pretty much. That's who they've modeled their entire society on. Yeah, and they do this in little, uh, like like an assembly line. Yeah. They will gnaw into the earth, and they will pass dirt back, and eventually that dirt forms, what else? A molehill. Yeah, I saw that was kind of like a conveyor belt. So there's one mole, or one naked mole rat at the front doing all the digging, and there's a bunch of mole rats following them that are sweeping, like, a specific pile out, and as they're they're sweeping it further and further back, and as they're moving backward, they finally get to the end, and then there's a larger mole rat there who's kicking it outside, forming that molehill you were talking about. And then when the, when the mole rat that's been sweeping it to the guy who's kicking it out of the tunnel, they climb back over the people in front of them and go yeah. to the front of the line again. <laughs> so it is. It's like this conveyor belt that's just tunneling, like boring through the earth. And this is really hard, packed, dry dirt, too. It's, it's not easy stuff to chew through. No, they make uh, they make easier work out of it when things are a little wetter. Mm-hmm. But generally, this dirt is fairly dry, like you said, so it's pretty tough. Uh, and we mentioned that they are hairless. They do have some tiny, tiny little hairs here and there. They have some sensory hairs on their faces and tails, and a little bit of hair between their toes, so they can uh, sweep away that dirt, like you were talking about. Mm-hmm. But if, if you look at a naked mole rat, I mean, the first thing that you're going to say is that thing's naked. And look at those teeth, and uh, I imagine a large one would be terrifying because they're pretty small, like we said, just a few inches. Yes. Um, did you watch the Smithsonian naked mole rat cams? Uh, no, but there's so much of that in Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control. Okay. It's amazing. I had not I had not seen them before, and they are really cute. They're so studious and so serious about the digging around and moving <laughs> they around work, that they're doing. They work very hard. Pushing this thing over there, and they just, they're super cute when you, when you watch them. And, um, apparently, they're not very aggressive. There's only specific instances where they show aggression, but for the most part, they're pretty peaceful, even though to us they would seem pretty rude because they climb over one another, in part because... They are very closely related, so, you know, they're fine with that. But also because their habitats are enormous, but they still live on top of each other. Like a naked mole rat tunnel system can be comprised of miles of tunnel yeah. that's spread out over, like, five acres of land. Um, and yet when, they're, when they live together, they live in a really tight, close-knit um, community that they're, they literally crawl on top of each other. Yeah, they crawl all over each other like it's nothing, like they're crawling over like a rock or something. Mm -hmm. And they are just as good at going backwards as forwards. And when we say that, like, we mean it. They've they've done little races, and they found that naked mole rats can go backwards just as fast as they can go forwards and are just as coordinated, which isn't super coordinated, but— we're talking naked mole rats here that's in a smallish tunnel. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm pretty stimulated, Chuck. Do you want to take a break? Yeah, let's take a break since okay. you're stimulated. I got a de-stim. Stuff you should know. Stuff you should know. Should know.
I'm pretty destimmed. I'm feeling all right now. You feeling good? Yeah, but I'm going to get stimulated again, Chuck, because there's so much more. Like, we haven't even really tapped into the most amazing stuff about naked mole rats. Like, all this is still, this is neat, this is interesting, but just wait, everybody. Just you wait. Should we talk about respiration? I think we should. Well, here's the deal. They're underground in these very tight spaces. Mm -hmm. And down there, because there are so many naked mole rats, I don't think we said, but they live in uh, colonies, and we'll get to the social structure because it's very, very interesting mm -hmm. uh, among mammals for sure, and especially among rodents. But, you know, 70 to 200 to 300 naked mole rats living together in these tightish quarters, even though it's spread out, you know, they're, they're small tunnels because they're small animals. Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of oxygen down there. Um, they can get by on a, a startlingly low amount of oxygen. Yeah, in an environment that's also high in carbon dioxide. Like you or yeah. I would suffocate to death in a naked mole rat tunnel system. I need an animal would, I think. Yeah, pretty much. And the reason why is because they've, they've become adapted to that kind of environment, a low oxygen, high carbon dioxide environment. And the way that they've adapted is they have – they have evolved a system that, aside from naked mole rats, has only been found in plants. That's right. So, oh, I'll keep going. So the fructose <laughs> pump, we all yeah. have fructose pumps, but ours are all in our guts. The naked mole rats have a fructose pump that uses a metabolic pathway that takes fructose to be burned for energy in their brains. And the reason fructose is so important is because it can be burned anaerobically. You don't need oxygen to power that, that um, system of energy creation uh, or unlocking energy, I guess, from the fructose. You can just do it without oxygen. So they lower their metabolism enough that um, they don't need much, much oxygen. They can get by on the burning fructose until there's more oxygen available again. Yeah, it can live in an atmosphere that is 20% uh, oxygen and 80% CO2. And they've been able to survive for at least five hours with as little as 5% oxygen. 5%. Yeah, you couldn't do that. I think 20% is like the Andes. 5% is not much at all. No. So um, there's another thing. I said that they were generally peaceful. They're generally peaceful within the colony. Apparently, there's a behavior that queens have where they show up and they'll just start shoving workers around. <laughs> Did yeah. you see that? Yeah, yeah. And they're not they quite be, sure why. They can why. be aggressive at times. Yeah, but it's mostly just the queen, and she's mostly shoving workers. They thought maybe it, they were, it was because they were being lazy, but the, the worker is much more likely to be shoved while they're working, which just seems obnoxious. Maybe it's just a little reminder, you but, know? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but other than that, they aren't very aggressive unless you're a naked mole rat from another colony. And from what I saw, if you stumble into a naked mole rat colony and you're an outsider, they yeah. will kill you. Yeah, it's not pretty. Um, if you're a predator as well, uh, they will band together and stack on one another and reveal those teeth uh, if, a, <laughs> if a centipede or a snake or something comes down there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, and like you said, if, if, you, if you're not a member of the family, and I guess we should go ahead and say it, like, they're all the same family, right? Isn't there a lot of incest going on? Yeah, let's talk about their incest, shall we? Sure. <laughs> so they inbreed. Um, th the The reason why is because they have one queen. Uh, that's just part of their their hierarchy, their social structure, and um, the queen has a very limited number of of people to breed with. She basically says, "You, you, and you. You're mm -hmm. my breeding males. Everybody else." Not only, like, don't breed with the queen, somehow, mysteriously, the queen keeps worker males and worker females from even, even like, maturing sexually. Yes. They have no idea how this is happening because if you take a non-breeding worker male and a non-breeding worker female out of their colony, within days, they develop, like, a, adult mature reproductive systems and can reproduce. So yeah, like, something a, going on. A, a male literally will... They have tiny kind of buried testicles, but five days after they're out of that hole, mm -hmm. those testicles literally grow. Yeah, you should see that on fast motion. It's really funny. <laughs> Please tell me that's not existent. I'll bet there's a gif out there somewhere. Uh, okay. <laughs> I haven't seen it, though. Uh, yeah, but it's it's weird. It's this suppression of, uh, of reproduce ability, 
and it's it's the queen. It's just the queen, and and all the other males have their hands up, and only if you get to go in there and take care of business. Yeah. So very frequently, they're her own offspring. That's just how it goes for sure. a couple of reasons. One, she makes so many. Um, she has so many litters over her lifetime, and then also they are um, they're they're very long lived. I think in captivity they live up to thirty years so far. I saw longer too. I saw one that was like close to forty. So we've only been studying them in captivity for about forty ish years, maybe fifty. So we don't really know what their actual, like, the upper limit of their lifespan is. We'll talk about that later. But a mouse, if it's lucky, lives five years in captivity. These guys are living 30, 40 years, right? That's old. Yeah, I saw the queens um, not in captivity. Can It's usually like 18 to 20 years. Okay. So, underground, which is still remarkable. Yeah, that's super remarkable. So during that time, because she she's creating so many litters and there's outsiders who come to the colony get killed, she has to. It's inevitable. She's she's um, reproducing with her own kin. And so they found genetically, Chuck, that the average um, genetic similarity between uh, just any two members of a colony is about 0.5. In human terms, 0.5 is what a parent and their offspring has. These are just brothers and sisters have 0.5 similarity. Yeah. I think between um, the queen and her offspring, it's like 0.8. And you're like, what is all this getting at? The highest number you can get to is 1.0, and that's yeah. for um, identical twins that came from the same egg. They're almost genetically it, it, perfectly identical. And the, the queen and her offspring are like at 0. 0.8. So they are super <laughs> yeah. duper inbred. Yeah. They're, I mean, it's only them down there. What happens underground stays underground. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> uh, the other cool thing or another cool thing about them living underground is that they're basically cold-blooded. Uh, so I think te scientifically, technically, they're probably not. But effectively, they are cold-blooded. Um, mammals because they don't have self-regulating body temperature. Uh, they regulate their body temperature in a, in a few ways, but they basically call it behavioral uh, regulation, thermoregulation. Mm -hmm. uh, they will they will work harder sometimes to get their you know to get the heat going. They will stack themselves on one another when it's colder, mm -hmm. uh, and they will go higher in the tunnel system closer to the surface to feel that sun's heat. Uh, but but still not go outside to warm up. Uh, right. When it's colder, they will. Or I'm sorry. When it's warmer, they will go deeper and have more space in between them and stuff like that. And yet, despite all that, despite not being able to regulate their own temperature, they still maintain about in the 80s Fahrenheit. Yeah. That's how warm it is in in a, a naked mole rat tunnel system. And the humidity is like 50 to 60 percent. That's balmy. It's balmy. It's warm. Uh, and it's not balmy because it's full of water because get this. I know you know this. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to the people in podcast land. Oh, I know. They don't drink water. They don't They don't uh, say like they try to seal off those tunnels. Uh, it, you know, it's not probably not possible to completely seal them off, but they would flood very easily if they didn't do as good a job as they do yeah, already. for sure. But it's not like they dig little water wells uh, and let them fill up and go lap it up, you know, through those teeth. Mm -hmm. They don't drink water. They get water from what they eat. Uh, we said they didn't go out to, to find food and stuff, so you're wondering, like, what are they eating, like little insects who stumble in there? No. No, they are eating uh, roots and bulbs and rhizomes and, you know, tubers, like basically what what part of the plant is underground. Mm -hmm. They're eating that stuff, and that's also where they're getting every bit of water they need. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Uh, again, like they live in the desert. So this is where desert plants store their waters in like big tubers and bulbs. And typically when a naked mole rat goes out and stumbles into a tuber, they'll um, they'll start bringing it back to the rest of the colony. They're very, yeah. very good like that. They really look out for one another. But once in a while, they'll find a tuber that's like 50 pounds. It's just yeah. huge, and there no naked mole rat could do anything with that. So they eat it in situ, and they do it in such a way that when they'll bore a hole into this giant tuber, eat the inside flesh, and then come back out, and they'll plug the hole with dirt. And then yeah. they'll let the tuber, like, regenerate, let the plant, like, regrow, 
And then they'll go back and do it again once the plant's healthy again. Isn't that neat? It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah, and they're not they're not doing this in any kind of uh, I don't think we mentioned like their their sleep cycles. They're not uh, they work together like very very well, mm-hmm. and we'll talk about that structure more in a minute. Mm-hmm. But it's not like they get up in the morning. They don't know what morning is. They're underground. Yeah. So as far as anyone can tell, they don't have any kind of regular sleep cycle going on. They just they work when they're supposed to work, and they work till they get tired, and then they sleep. Yeah. There's no morning underground. Isn't that grim? But, yeah, but that's a that's a song title mm-hmm. of some sort of death metal band, probably. I think you could make it the the titular song title for the album. The Naked Mole Rats. Sure, that's the, that's the name of the band. I guess no. I mean, like there is no morning underground is the name of the it's first oh, single sure. and the album. Yeah, and the album. <laughs> and then in parentheses it says like "Believe Me" or something like that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, or can we talk? I mean, we talked about what they eat, but we should also talk about the other thing they sometimes eat. I'm kind of excited about this. <laughs> Take it away, then. They eat poop. They eat their own poop. They eat their own poop. They eat others' poop. Apparently, the adults of the colony will poop directly into the mouths of the pups when they need oh, it, when they want man. it. Man. And this all sounds gross, and it is. I think even other types of mole rats are like, good God, <laughs> have you seen what our cousins do when we're not around? Uh-huh. But there's a there's a good reason for this. This is actually a big strategy. They have a, a gut to um, digest this these really hard tubers. This is not the kind of like root vegetables you would get at a grocery store. This is wild sub-Saharan Africa tubers that they're eating and trying to digest. And they can't possibly digest it all the first time. So when they poop... It's still chock full of food, so they don't waste it. They just eat the poop. That's right. And they have a hind gut because, uh, you know, the, uh, herbivores often have uh, things inside their body that are going to help them digest this really fibrous plant matter. Mm-hmm. And they do have a hind gut that is really good for that, but it's still not good enough. And so, like you said, they they eat, they poop, they eat it again, and that pretty much takes care of it. There's one other really cool thing about it, too. Well, there's two other cool things about eating poop. One, when the adults poop into the pups' mouths, Mm -hmm. they're not just feeding them. They're also um, transferring gut microbiota, which will help them uh, protect them from disease, will help them digest stuff even better. Um, It's pretty neat. And then they also think we talked about... um, suppressing the the reproductiveness of the others like the other females the queen can somehow re, re, um, repress them they don't know how she's doing that but they do think that the reason why other non-worker females help raise pups with no incentive whatsoever and with no reproductive organs or horm- hormones uh-huh. is that when they eat the queen's poop she passes just enough estrogen to them to make them want to take care of the pups <laughs> That is astounding. It is. Uh, and there's one more uh, part to the poop. We mentioned if you come in and you're a, a, from another colony, mm-hmm. you're in big trouble. Um, they also think that feeding the poop and also occasionally rolling in the poop mm-hmm. is a way that they can impart like a colony smell that everyone's going to have. Yeah. So everybody will smell the same. So if somebody shows up, you're like, you're not Terry. And then they're dead. Right, Because they can tell from your smell. Because their sense of smell is just ridiculously acute. That's basically what they have. Smell, touch, and then hearing somehow. Because they make more um, vocalizations than any other rodent on the planet. And yet they basically don't have ears. So I'm not sure how they do that. Yeah. I mean, we can talk about that a little bit. Okay. They have um, – the queen has a toilet song when she goes poo-poo uh, <laughs> in her toilet chamber. And uh, I guess we should also say that they, they have different chambers for different things. They have – they have bathrooms mm-hmm. and they have bedrooms. Uh, they have these sort of expressway superhighways that are a little larger where they're just crawling all over each other back and forth. But they have different rooms and one of them is a, is a bathroom and she sings a little toilet song when she goes. Uh, and they think that might be like, hey, uh, I just pooped. Is anyone going to come in here and eat this or am I going to have to throw it at you? <laughs> uh, she also says, uh, hey, you three that I picked out earlier, mm-hmm. I'm ready uh, to have intercourse with you. you. So here, here, here's my song for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we mentioned those predators. There are sounds for predator invasions. Uh, and then, you know, and this might lead us into talking about the social structure uh, maybe after a break. Yeah. But they do have little chirps 
uh, that will signal their social order, which is still not quite figured out. But uh, maybe we'll take a break there and talk about that. Let's do it. All right. We'll be right back. So we mentioned early on that they are a part of the uh, Bathier Gid. Is that right? Yeah. All right. Uh, Bathier Gid group. Um, and they are generally pretty solitary. Uh, they're, they may live with a few others here and there, but they don't do what naked mole rats do, which is, you know, colonies that can get up into the hundreds. Mm-hmm. Um, they're, the closest thing that you can compare a naked mole rat to is like an ant colony. Yeah, or bees. Like they're like you find you sociality. They're you social. I think you said before. Um, you find that in the insect world, not in the mammal world. Apparently, there's only other one kind of mole rat that has a uh, you social um, hierarchy. But theirs is even like it's just nothing compared to the rigidity of the naked mole rats. Yeah. So you social means it is like you said it is rigid. It is very defined, uh, but they don't fully understand that structure um, in full. They have some little clues. I think some of the males vary in size a little bit, mm-hmm. and I think they think that the ones that are a little bigger may be higher up on the you know social structure. Uh, they most of them are workers, but some of them it seems are specifically soldiers yeah. that kind of are on the front lines mm-hmm. when that scorpion comes down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have a division of labor. What else? Well, I've got so there. So the fact that they're you social is not intuitive because the, no one knew that there was such a thing as mammals that were you social. And I found out that they've only known that these things were you social for since like the eighties or nineties. And yeah. the way that they found out was really astounding because some of these early um, naked mole rat researchers were like. Where are, why aren't these, these mole rats pregnant? Like, I have not seen a pregnant female because they didn't know that it's just the queen that's creating the litters, right? And right. there was a, a biologist named Richard Alexander who described a hypothetical eusocial mammal species. And somebody who was a researcher named uh, Jennifer Jarvis, who was a naked mole uh, rat researcher, was like, buddy, you just described naked mole rats, and I think you just solved this puzzle, this mystery that they're actually a eusocial mammal species, and that's how we figured it out, just totally by chance. Yeah, and, you know, we mentioned the queen a few times. The queen is obviously at the top of that eusocial structure. Uh, and much like bees that we've talked about a lot, mm-hmm. uh, that that queen runs the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is almost always only one queen. I think in rare cases there can be a couple of queens. But when it's time for a new queen to take the crown, there is a big uh, fight. Uh, the females sometimes will kill each other to become queen. Oh yeah, but it's a it's a violent affair to become queen, um, and they think that this is one of the reasons, uh, one of a few reasons why the queen uh, ends up larger is because uh, you may start out a little larger if you're the one defeating the other females, mm-hmm. uh, and then this is another remarkable naked mole rat fact: once you become queen your body literally gets longer. Your spine lengthens. Yeah. Like I saw a picture, I think uh, Ed added it in this article, the knee of like the first litter queen, you know, five litter queen, 10 uh-huh. litter queen. And that like, it, I think the 10 litter queen, her spine is about at least one and a half times the length of what it would have been the, during her first litter. That's how significantly their body changes so that they can have, larger and larger litters over time. Yeah, it's 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 remarkable. Um, and how many, so they can have up to like 10 litters total throughout their life? I think it can get even, even larger than that, I've seen. And I, I think that the number of pups in a litter, the record is 27. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they're having a lot, and they can have tons of litters over their lifetime, and then... Um, as many as, you know, 27 in a single litter. They're really reproducing. There's a lot of pressure on them to, to produce. You know what I mean? 
Oh, totally. Um, you know, we mentioned that they almost never, never go outside of the uh, cave system and the tunnel system. The very few times that they've seen it happen is like uh, they call it like a mini migration where they will see one, maybe try to go to a different colony. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they figured out why they would leave their colony, but periodically that will happen and they will travel at night, of course, uh, because if they went out in the sun in the desert during the day, they would probably fry like little sausages with teeth, like you said. For sure. Bratwurst. So they, yeah. they also think that uh, one of the main reasons that they would ever leave the colony and go up top is to form a new colony, kind of like a peaceful, um, I guess, a peaceful coup, a bloodless coup that actually leaves mm -hmm. the existing queen in place. Because, you know, bees do that. They'll, when they swarm, that's a bunch of bees in a colony that's gotten overcrowded going and forming their own colony. The, apparently, as you social mammals, that's what naked mole rats do as well sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty Nuts. interesting. Um, and I guess we should talk about the final remarkable fact about naked mole rats mm -hmm. is that they don't age in the sense that we think about aging. Right. Uh, they get older on the calendar, but they have shown a remarkable lack of, like, their body and their organs and, like, their tissue and stuff like that showing signs of traditional aging. Yeah, which is, I mean, they get up to 30, like six times the average age of a, a mouse or the, the far end age of a mouse. And they're just not aging. No inflammation. Their bones don't deteriorate. They just are ageless. And people, researchers who started to notice this, are like, what is going on? Uh, and they have kind of zeroed in on one particular um, molecule called uh, hyaluronon. And uh, you might be familiar yeah, with hy hy hyaluronic acid, which uh -huh. people love to put in like their facial um, moisturizers and stuff like that because it's found in skin. Well, it's also found in naked mole rat skin, and it's found in aces. They have 10 times the amount that humans do, and the, the molecules of hy hyaluronon um, that they do have are like five times larger in size. Yeah, so they have more bigger hyaluron molecules, uh -huh. and they think that it's possible because they're very resistant to uh, they found out at first they were very resistant to tumors and cancer. And so they're like, in the naked mole rat, does the is is that the secret to curing cancer? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that anyone is like saying that they're right around the corner from figuring that out. Mm -hmm. But they have gotten this hyaluron and they have put it uh, in mice and that they because mice are very cancer prone, which is one reason we study mice when we study cancer. Right. But they have found that these mice, uh, do much better and they live longer and they uh, it's it's almost like an immediate shot of youth when they get this stuff. Yeah, when they transfer the hyaluronon synthase 2 gene into mice, they um, really benefit from it. And then on the cancer front, um, when they when they suppress the tumor suppressing genes that are found in in mammals in the naked mole rats, they mm -hmm. still don't get tumors. But when they suppress the gene that expresses hyaluronon, they start to get tumors. So they've pretty much zeroed in on hyaluronon as some sort of a anti-tumor agent, and it's a gooey sugar, and they've shown that it, 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 when you remove it from a Petri dish of um, naked mole rat cells, the cells will goop together, but they won't stick together as long as there's hyaluronon in there. Yeah, and it's in, it's, uh, it's in their, like you said, their connective tissue, so it's one of the reasons they have uh, that that loose kind of stretchy weird looking skin mm -hmm. is because of this hyaluronon and we went over we drove right by one of the facts that you dug up that's pretty amazing is that in their is it their body can move inside their skin mm -hmm. without their skin moving they can turn about halfway around within their skin it's that loose so like they they could be doing that in front of your face and you would not know it because their skin is just Static. Yeah, you'd be like, wow, why is their head over there all of a sudden? Right. They still <laughs> seem to be facing forward. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and that skin comes in handy when they're crawling around those tunnels and uh, slipping by each other and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Uh, I mean, there are reasons why their skin is like that 
and it's it's just remarkable these little guys. Yeah, and they think that that the anti-aging, anti-tumor traits that they've uh, developed over time are just a, a byproduct of the actual adaptation, which is super right. loose skin um, that's created by cells that aren't allowed to stick together. Yeah. And they've also found out that they don't experience pain yeah. like other mammals do. Um, and you would, uh, of course, the first thing you think of is like pain is a good thing because that tells you when you've got your hand on a hot stove or what have you. That's not the first thing I think of. <laughs> it's not? <laughs> no, I think of that's great. I don't like pain. Oh, sure. But it's a, you know, we have to have pain so we know when we're experiencing uh, something that could kill us. Granted. Uh, but they have a, a just enough of a pain receptor to, like, keep them from dying stupidly, mm-hmm. but not enough to actually feel pain. And I saw this one um, fact, I guess, from an experiment. That means, like, somebody actually did this. Mm-hmm. They said that their skin doesn't respond to pain when you put acid mm-hmm. or uh, capsaicin, like what they put in, uh, like, pepper, mm-hmm. you know, hot pepper stuff, like in pepper spray. Right. That's capsaicin. And their skin doesn't react when you put that stuff on their skin. Yeah, or they don't. Even if their skin's showing signs of burning, they're just like, what? I, I didn't hear what no, you No, their said. skin literally doesn't respond to acid. Oh, so the skin itself doesn't. The skin itself doesn't. Okay, but I get the impression also that if you, like, hurt one, Ugh. I hate to even talk about this, but if you hurt one, it wouldn't even notice it because its pain threshold is so high. And the reason they think that this is the case is because their their metabolism is so fragile. They're on such like a razor's edge that they think that their nervous system evolved to, like you said, just give them enough pain signals to get by, but not enough to really require a lot of extra energy. They don't need that kind of sensation to to survive. Does that mean in some lab somewhere they draw straws to see who has to thump the naked mole rat? <laughs> I'll be, yeah, I'll bet that's a bummer day for you at the office. Ugh. Would be for me. Uh, I think that's all the amazing facts. I'm looking over my notes. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anything else, is there? I don't think so. Uh, the only thing I, mean, I would enough. say is go to the Smithsonian Naked Mole Rat cams as soon as yeah. you can. They're very cute to watch. Yeah. And watch Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control. It's a great documentary uh, because he somehow managed, manages to, uh, Errol Morris does, to to tie each of these professions into a, into a, a theme a common theme nice. that's really interesting. That guy's good. And if you think about it, it's robots that this guy's making that look like insects. Uh, it's plants that a guy is shaping to look like animals. Wait, it wait, are little... you spoiling it right now? No. Okay. These are just the jobs they have. Okay. Uh, the naked mole rat guy, well, I'm trying to figure out how that figured in that way. I can't remember. It's been a while. But anyway, this guy's enthusiasm uh, the scientist that they found is just very contagious awesome. of how much he loves these naked mole rats. I could see it. I mean, you could do a lot worse to pin your career to a other a, that animal if, yeah. as a biologist. Like, they are just coming up with some amazing stuff. Agreed. So, since I mentioned amazing stuff and Chuck said agreed, that means, everybody, it's time for listener mail. That's right. Uh, but I'm going to shout out that naked mole rat guy. His name is Ray Mendez. And uh, he's he's pretty amazing. Nice. All right, so I'm gonna call this. Let me see. I'm gonna open up the folder. Oh Listen boy! Mail. You guys, you don't know what this means. When Chuck opens up the folder, it gets real. <laughs> uh. Oh boy, that's an old one. I'm gonna read that one. That might be out of date. Okay. I'll read. Uh, oh, okay. This is fairly recent. Uh, Hoya. Remember we talked about the Georgetown Hoyas, mm-hmm. and we we're like, "What the heck is a Hoya?" Mm-hmm. We heard from a few Hoyas. Mm-hmm. And this was from uh, Mark Mayer, or Mark Meyer, excuse me. Uh, hey guys, first time writer, long time listener, graduate of Georgetown U, and uh, I actually have some knowledge to give back. Your answer to the question, what is a Hoya, is exactly. Let me explain. Uh, <laughs> what I was taught was that Georgetown's nickname uh, came from the Stone Walls, named after the university's beautiful walls, or the football team's uh, defense, depending on who you ask. Okay, uh, defense. The good Jesuits that we are, uh, our cheer was the Latin translation of what rocks, Hoya Saxa. And that was eventually shortened to Hoyas. Uh, The mascot changed, but the nickname stuck. So if a Georgetown, uh, if you ask a Georgetown student what a Hoya is, the standard tongue-in-cheek response is something like, 
correct or exactly. Uh, what is a Hoya? Because the word Hoya literally translates to what? <laughs> what is Hoya is how I should have read that. Now I understand why people don't like Georgetown graduates. <laughs> I never knew, but now I do. Uh, Mark says, this is some 19th century who's on first type of fun. I uh, hope this helps. Thanks for the quality entertainment that has gotten me through uh, countless uh, mows, drives, and runs. Mm -hmm. I guess mowing lawn? Sure. All right. That's from Mark Meyer. Thanks a lot, Mark. That was great knowledge you imparted. Thank you very much. I can't wait till somebody asks me what's a Hoya. Can't wait. Say exactly. I can't wait. Uh, and if you want to be like Mark and send us some info that we didn't know, you can put it in an email and send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Listener.